Three Lives by Tuesday Love Sang Grandpa Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. Chapter 6 Molly Grubber came awake with a start of fright. Oh, my goodness me, he exclaimed. I'm late for work. I'll be fired, and then I'll have to go on unemployment benefit. He jumped out of bed and stood as though rooted in the floor. He gazed about him, wondering at the beautiful furniture and marveling at the view through the large window. Then slowly it all came back to him. He felt very refreshed. He had never felt better in his life. In his life? Well, where was he now? He did not believe in life after death, but he had died all right. No doubt about that. So he must have been wrong, and there was life after death. A man came in, wearing a cheerful smile, and he said, So, you are one of the ones who like breakfast, eh? You like your food, do you, eh? Molly Grubber's insides began to rumble and rattle as a reminder. I sure do, he replied. I don't know how one would get on without food. I like food. I like a lot of food. But I've never had much. He paused and looked down at his feet and said, I lived on coffee and hamburgers that was cheap. That's about all I did live on, except for a hunk of bread now and then. Gee, I would like a good meal. The man looked at him and said, Well, order what you want. You can have it. Molly Grubber stood there full of indecision. There were so many wonderful things he had seen, typed on notices outside hotels and restaurants. How was it again? He thought for a minute, and then almost drooled as he called to mind a special breakfast he had read posted up outside one of the local better-class places. Deviled kidneys, fried eggs, toast, ooh, such a lot of things. Some of them were quite beyond his comprehension. He'd never even tasted some of them, but... The man, looking at him, suddenly smiled and said, Okay, I've got it. You've sent me a clear picture of what you want, and there it is. With that, he laughed and turned and went out of the room. Molly Grubber looked after him in some astonishment, wondering why he'd taken off in such a hurry. What about breakfast? Where was it? The man had asked him to order breakfast, and then he just walked away. A most wonderful aroma caused Molly Grubber to spin around, and there, right behind him, was a table with a beautiful white cloth on it, a serviette, silverware, beautiful crockery, and flatware, and then his eyes bulged at the sight of the meal in front of him, a meal covered over with shining metal covers. Gingerly he lifted one of the covers and nearly fainted with ecstasy at the smell coming from the plate. He had never seen food like this. But he looked about guiltily, wondering if all this was really for him. Then he sat down and tucked a serviette on his chest and really sat to. For quite a time there was nothing but munch, 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 as Molly Grubber's teeth bit into sausages, liver, kidneys, fried eggs, and a few other things, too. And then there was the crackling as he devoured the toast, followed by a slurping as he drank cup after cup of tea. It was a change from coffee, and he found he rather preferred it. He had never tasted tea before. Much later, 
He rose unsteadily from the chair and went to lie on the bed again. He had had such a meal that he could not stay awake. So he lay back, let himself relax, and drifted off into dreamland. In his dreams he thought of the earth. He thought of the hard time he had had there. He thought of his unknown father and his harridan mother. He thought of leaving home and going to work on the garbage dump and then, as he would have called it, working his way up to pushing a garbage barrel on the streets, sweeping the sidewalks. His thoughts went on and on. The pictures went round and round. Suddenly he opened his eyes to find the table had gone, and all the dishes had gone as well, and there, sitting opposite to him, was the doctor he had seen yesterday. "'Well, my boy,' said the doctor, "'you certainly took a load aboard, didn't you? Of course, you know, you don't need to have food on any of these worlds, or on any of these planes of existence.' It's just a throwback, just a useless habit carried over from earth where food was necessary. Here we take all our food, all our nourishment, all our energy from our surroundings. You will soon find you are doing the same because this food that you've been eating is quite an illusion. You are merely having energy done up in a different form. But now, we've got to talk. You have a lot to learn, so sit back or lie back and listen to me. Molly Grubber reclined on his bed and listened to what the doctor had to tell him. Mankind is an experiment confined to one particular universe the universe of which the earth was such a small, unimportant member. Mankind was merely the temporary clothing of immortal souls which had to get experience in hardship and discipline through corporeal existence, because such hardships did not exist on what are called the spirit worlds. There are entities always waiting to be born to an earth body, but things have to be carefully mapped out. First, what does the entity need to learn? Then, what sort of conditions should prevail throughout the life so that the entity can obtain the greatest advantage from the life on earth? The doctor looked at Molly Grubber and then said, you don't know much about this, do you? Molly Grubber looked up at him and replied, No, Doc, I know that people are born, and that's a messy process, and then they live a few years of hardship, and then they die and are stuck in a hole in the ground, and that's all there is to it. Well, that's what I thought until now. He said it reflectively. The doctor remarked, well, it's very difficult, you know, if you have no idea at all of what happens, because it seems to me that you think a person comes somewhere, or a baby is born, it lives, and it dies, and that's all there is to it. But it's not like that at all. I'll tell you about it. And this is what the doctor told him. Earth is just an insignificant little place in this universe, and this universe is an insignificant little place compared to other universes. The universe is teeming with life, life of many different kinds, life serving many different purposes. But the only thing that matters to humans at present is what happens to humans. It's all something like a school. You get a baby born, and then for a time it picks up and learns from its parents. It learns the rudiments of language. 
It learns some semblance of manners, of culture. Then, when the child is of suitable age, he goes to a kindergarten school, and in that school the child is kept during school hours while the poor wretched teacher tries distractedly to keep the child fairly peaceful and quiet until the end of the school day. The first term in school doesn't matter much, the same as the first life on earth doesn't matter much. The child progresses from class to class or grade to grade, each one becoming more important than the one before, until in the end the school classes or grades lead up to the culmination of one's achievement, whatever it may be. What is coming next? Such as pre-med school or law school or a lowly plumber's mate, no matter what it is. The person has to study and pass some examinations, and it is worth noting that some plumbers earn more than some doctors. The status symbolizing on earth is all wrong. It doesn't matter what a person's parents were. The only thing that matters in the afterlife is what that person has become. You can have an educated gentleman with the kindest of thoughts while he is just the son of a plumber on earth. Again, you can have another person who might even be the curator of a museum. He might have had all the advantages of a high birth status, and he may be worse than a pig in his manners or lack of manners. Values on earth are wrong, completely wrong. Only the values of the afterlife matter. In the early days of this particular round of civilization, things were rather rudimentary and crude. People learned lessons by going out and bonking somebody on the head, or by getting bonked on the head instead. Sometimes the two parties would be humble yeomen or farm workers. Sometimes they would be high knights jousting at a royal palace. It doesn't matter how you are killed. When you are killed, well, you're dead, and then you've got to go on to another life. As the world itself becomes more mature in this round of existence, the stresses and strains which one may have to overcome become more sophisticated. One goes to business and gets all the hatred, the jealousies, and the pettiness of office life, all the cutthroat competition in car salesmanship, insurance salesmanship, or any of the other competitive trades or professions, one is discouraged in present-day world life from knocking one's neighbor on the noggin. You have to do it by politely cutting his throat behind his back, or, in other words, getting him framed, so that if, for instance, you are an author, and you don't like another author, then you gang up with a couple of other authors, and you frame your victim. You produce a lot of false evidence, and then you get a pressman on the job. You pay him a dollop of money, and if he's a drinking sort of fellow, you wine him and dine him, and then he goes and writes an article about the victim and all the other silly creeps in the media, a most low profession or trade, lap it up, hook, line, and sinker, and they do their best to damn the author they've never even read or met. That's called civilization. The doctor paused and said, I hope you're taking all this in. If you're not, you'd better stop me. I've got to teach you something because you seem to have learned nothing at all 
in your earth life. Molly Grubber nodded. He was going a bit cross-eyed by now, and so the doctor continued. After one has decided in the astral world what is needed, then circumstances are investigated and suitable prospective parents are selected. Then, when the husband and wife on earth have done their stuff, the entity in the astral is prepared, and he dies to the astral world and is shoved out into the mundane world as a baby. In almost every instance, the trauma of getting born is so severe that he forgets all about his past life. And that is why we get people saying, Oh, I didn't ask to be born. Don't blame me for what I've done. When a person dies to the earth, he or she will have reached a certain status of understanding. He or she may have learned something of metaphysics, and so will have gained knowledge which helps in the next world. In a case like yours, Molly Grubber, you seem to be singularly bereft of all knowledge of life after death. So this is what it is like. If a person has only lived a very few lives on the earth plane, the three-dimensional plane, then when they leave the earth or die, at, as it is miscalled, the astral body or soul or whatever you like to call it is received into a low-grade astral world suitable for the knowledge of the person who has just arrived. You can say a human boy or man doesn't know much so he had to go to night classes. He can't climb up in society until he has learned enough to take his place in a higher society. It's quite the same in the astral worlds. There are many, many astral worlds, each one suitable for a particular type of person. Here in this world, which is the low astral of a fourth dimension, you will have to learn about metaphysics. You will have to learn how to think so that you may get clothing food, and anything else you need. You need yet to go to the Hall of Memories, where you will see all that you have done in your past life, and you will judge yourself. And I may say that no one judges one more harshly than one's over-self. The over-self can be likened to the soul, Briefly, there are about nine dimensions available in this particular sphere of activity. When one has finally reached embodiment in the ninth body, or over-self, then one is prepared to go up to higher realms and learn higher things. People, entities, are always striving to climb upwards, like plants striving to reach toward the light. This is a low astral world where you will have many lessons to learn. You will have to go to school and learn many facts of life on earth, many facts of life in the astral. Then later you will decide what type of lessons you have to learn. When all that has been decided upon, you will be able to return to the earth to suitable parents, and it is hoped that this time you will have more opportunities to climb upwards and to get a better status on the earth, a better soul status, that is, not just one's class on the earth. It is hoped that in the next life you will learn a lot so that when you leave the earth body again you will not come to this low stage but you will move upwards perhaps two perhaps three planes above this one 
The higher you climb in the astral planes, the more interesting your experiences and the less suffering you can endure. But you have to approach things like that carefully, gently and slowly. For example, if you were suddenly put upon an astral world two or three stages above this, you would be blinded by the intensity of the emanations from the guardians of that world. So, the sooner you learn that which you have to learn, the sooner you can go back to Earth and prepare for a higher stage. Let us say that a very, very good man indeed leaves the Earth, the three-dimensional Earth, from which you have so recently arrived. If the man is truly spiritual, he can go up two or three stages, and then he would not find harsh treatment such as that which you get on this plane. He would not find that he had to imagine food to eat, his body essence would absorb all the energy it needed from the surroundings. You could do that as well, but you are uneducated in such things. You cannot understand much about spirituality, as witness the admitted fact that until now you have not believed in life after death. Upon this plane this plane where you now reside, there are many, many people who did not believe there is life after death. And they are here to learn that there is. In later incarnations, you will strive up and up so that each time you die to the earth world and are reborn to an astral world, you will climb to a higher plane, and you'll have greater and greater time between incarnations. For instance, in your own case, suppose you were discharged from your employment on Earth. Well, in your particular job, there are usually plenty of vacancies. You could get a similar job the next day, but if you were a professor or something, to give you an illustration, you would have to try harder and wait longer to get suitable employment. Similarly, on this plane on which you are now lodged, you could be sent back to Earth world in a month or two. But when one gets to higher planes, one has to wait longer in order to recover from the psychic shocks endured on the earth. Molly Grubber sat up straight and said, Well, it's all beyond me, Doc. Guess I'll have to set to and learn something, eh? But one can speak to people on earth from here? The doctor looked at him for some moments and then said, if the matter is considered urgent enough, yes, under certain conditions and circumstances, a person on this plane can get in touch with someone on the earth. What have you got in mind? Molly Grubber looked a bit self-conscious. He looked at his feet, he looked at his hands, and he twiddled his thumbs, and then he said, Well, the guy that's got my old barrel? I don't like the way he's treating that barrel. I looked after it. I polished it with steel wool. I kept it as clean as clean could be. That fellow's got it all cabbed up with dirt. I wanted to get in touch with the superintendent at the depot and tell him to give the new man what took over my job a kick. You know where. The doctor looked quite a bit shocked, and said, But my good man, that is a thing you have to learn. You have to learn not to indulge in violence, not to judge another person harshly. Of course, it is extremely laudable that you cleaned your own work vehicle. 
but another man may have a different method of using his time. No, certainly, you cannot get in touch with your superintendent for such a frivolous reason. I suggest you forget about your life on earth. You are not there now. You're here. And the sooner you learn about this life and this world, the sooner you will be able to make progress because you are here to learn and to learn only so that you can be sent back to earth so that you will be able to earn a higher status. Molly Grubber sat there on the bed drumming his fingers on his knees. The doctor watched him in some curiosity, wondering how it was that on earth people could live for a number of years and still be a soul encased in clay, hardly knowing what went on about them, knowing nothing of the past or of the future. Suddenly he said, Well, what is it? Molly Grubber looked up with a start and replied, Oh, I've been thinking of things, and I understand I'm dead. Now, if I'm dead, why do I seem solid? I thought it was a ghost. Why do you seem solid? If you're a ghost, you should be like a whiff of smoke. The doctor laughed and said, Oh, the number of times I've been asked that. The answer is very, very simple. When you are on earth, you are of basically the same type of material as all the others around you, so you see each other as solid. But if a person, me, for example, came from the astral world and went down to the earth, I would be so tenuous to the solid earth people, that either they would not see me, or they would see right through me. But here, you and I are of the same material, same density of material, so to each other we are solid. All the things about you are solid. And mark this well, when you get to higher planes of existence, your vibrations will be higher and higher, so that if a person from, uh, let us say, the fifth level came to us now, we should not see him. He would be invisible to us, because he would be of even finer material. Molly Grubber just could not take it in. He sat there looking uncomfortable, looking embarrassed, and twiddling his fingers around. The doctor said, You don't follow me at all, do you? No, replied Molly Grubber, not at all. The doctor sighed and said, Well, I suppose you know a little about radio. You've listened to radio sets. Now you know... You cannot get FM radio on a set designed for AM only. And you cannot get AM on a radio designed for FM only. Well, that should give you a line of thought. Because you can say that FM is high frequency and AM is low frequency. In the same way, you can say that we, on this plane of existence, are high frequency, and the people of Earth are low frequency. And that should enable you to realize that there are more things in heaven and on Earth than you know about. But now you are here, and you've got a few things to learn. Molly Grubber suddenly had a flash picture of when he used to go to Sunday school, for two or three Sundays only, but it still came to his mind. He stopped twiddling his fingers, he stopped fiddling with his toes, and he looked at the doctor. Doc, he asked, is there any truth in it that people who are really holy Joes get a front seat in heaven? 
The doctor laughed outright and said, Oh, dear, oh, dear, so many people have that crazy idea. No, there's no truth to that at all. People are not judged on which religion they follow, but they are judged on the inner workings of their mind. Do they try to do good? Or do they do good as a sort of insurance for when they die to the earth? Well, that's a question one has to be able to answer. When people pass over, at first they see and experience what they expect to see and what they expect to experience. For instance, if an ardent Catholic has been brought up on a diet of angels and heavenly music and a lot of saints playing harps, then that is what they will see when they pass over. But when they do realize that all that is is sham hallucination, then they see the true reality, and the sooner they see it, the better for them. He stopped and looked very seriously at Molly Grubber before going on. There is one good thing to be said for people like you. They have no false ideas about what they are going to see. Many of the people of your type keep an open mind. That is, they neither believe nor disbelieve. And that's a lot better than being too slavish in the following of any particular discipline. Molly Grubber sat very still, his face puckered in a frown so deep that his eyebrows almost met, and then he said, I was scared out of my pants when I was a youngster. I was always being told that if I didn't do what I was told I would go to hell, and a lot of devils would prod me, well, you know where, with red hot toasting forks, and I would suffer a lot of pain. How come, if God is so great, if God is our kind, benevolent Father, then how come he wants to torture us forever and a day? That's what I can't understand. The doctor sighed deeply deeply, and then after some slight pause he said, Yes, that's one of the biggest difficulties we have. People have been given false values. They've been told false things. They've been told they'll go to hell and suffer eternal damnation. Now there isn't a word of truth in that. Hell is the earth. Entities go to earth to experience, mainly through hardship, and learn, again mainly through hardship, all the various things which they have to learn. Earth is usually a place of suffering. If a person has a low state of evolution, then usually he or she doesn't have enough of what we call karma to have to suffer in order to learn. They stay on earth to gain some experience by watching others, and then, later, they come back for their hardships. But there is no hell after the life on earth. That is illusion. That is false teaching. Molly Grubber said, Well then, how did so much about hell get in the good book? Because, responded the doctor, in the time of Christ, there was a village named Hell. It was a village on the outskirts of very high land, and outside the village there was a quaking bog, which was smoking hot and with a continual stench of sulphur fumes and brimstone. If a person was accused of something, he was brought to the village of hell, so that he could endure the ordeal of passing through hell, passing through the smoking bog of sulphur and brimstone, in the belief that if 
he was guilty, the heat would overcome him and he would fall to the ground and be burned up by the heat of the bog. But if he was innocent, or if he had enough money to bribe the priests in charge of the place so that they could put a coating on his feet, then he could go all the way through the bog and emerge safely on the other side, then he would be considered an innocent man. We get the same thing now, don't we, with the way justice is often bought and the innocent get imprisoned while the guilty go free. There is another thing that puzzles me, said Molly Grubber. I've been told that when one dies there are helpers on the other side, wherever that is, who come and help a person get into heaven or the other place. Well, I'm supposed to have died, but I sure didn't see any helpers. I had to get there all on my own, just like a baby being born unexpectedly. Now, what's all this about helpers? The doctor looked at Molly Grubber and said, Well, of course there are helpers helping those who want to be helped. But if a person you, for instance, will not believe in anything, then you can't believe in helpers either. So if you can't believe in helpers, they cannot get close to you to help you. Instead, you're encased in that thick black fog of your own ignorance, your own lack of belief, your own lack of understanding. Oh yes, definitely, there are helpers who come if they are permitted to come. In the same way, usually one's parents or relatives who have passed over come to greet the one newly arrived in the astral planes of existence, but this particular plane is the lowest plane, that which is nearest to the earth, and you are here because you did not believe in anything. So because you were so ignorant, you find it even more difficult to believe in higher planes than this, so you're here in what some people regard as purgatory. Purgatory means to purge, a place of purging, and until you are purged of your lack of belief then you cannot progress upwards. And so because you are in this plane, you cannot meet those who have been friendly with you in other lives. They are so much higher. Molly Grubber stirred uncomfortably and said, Gee, I sure seem to have upset the apple cart. So what happens now? With that, the doctor rose to his feet and signaled for Molly Grubber to do likewise. He said, You have to go to the Hall of Memories now, where you will see every event of your life on earth. Seeing those events, you will judge what you have done successfully. You will judge what you have done unsuccessfully, and then you will have the nucleus of an idea in your mind as to what you have to do to improve yourself in a next earth life. Come on. With that, he walked to the wall, and an opening appeared. He and Molly Grubber passed through and moved along to the big hall again. The doctor walked to a man sitting at a desk, and they had a short conversation. Then the doctor returned to Molly Grubber and said, This way we turn down here. Together they walked down a long corridor and out into the open to a long grassy sward, at the far end of which there was a peculiar building which looked as if it was made of crystal, reflecting all the colors of the rainbow and many other colors which Molly Grubber simply could not name. They stopped outside the door and the doctor said, There, 
That is the hall of memories. There is one on every plane of existence after one gets beyond the earth plane. You go in there and you'll see before you a facsimile of the earth floating in space. As you walk toward it, you will have a sensation of falling, falling, and then it will seem as though you were upon the earth, watching all that happens, seeing all but not being seen. You will see everything that you have done. You will see actions you have taken and how they have affected other people. This is the Hall of Memories. Some call it the Hall of Judgment. But of course, there is no great judge sitting in solemn state who will look you up and down and then weigh your soul in the balance to see if it is wanting and then if it is, toss you into eternal fires. No, there's nothing like that. In the Hall of Memories, each person sees himself or herself, and each person judges whether he or she has been successful. If not, why not? And what can be done about it? Now, he took Molly Grubber's arm and urged him gently forward, I leave you here. Go into the Hall of Memories, Take as much time as is required, and when you come out, another person will be waiting for you. Goodbye. With that, he turned and walked away. Molly Grubber stayed there with a strange feeling of dread. He did not know what he was going to see, and he did not know what he was going to do about what he was going to see. But he showed no sign of moving. He seemed like a statue, a statue of a street sweeper without his barrow. And at last some strange force turned him gently and pushed him along in the direction of the portal of the Hall of Memories. Molly Grubber entered. And so it came to pass that Leonides Manuel Molly Grubber entered unto the Hall of Memories, and there he saw the history of himself and his associates since the beginning of time as an entity. He learned much. He learned of the mistakes of the past. He learned of things for which to prepare for the future, and by means unknown on the earth, his comprehension was expanded, his character purified, and Leonides Manuel Molly Grubber left the Hall of Memories at some undetermined time, it may have been days later, it may have been weeks later, or it may have been months later, and then he sat down with a group of counselors and planned his return to earth so that, a task having been completed during the next life, he could return again to a much better plane of astral life. End of chapter 6